Hello, fellow teachers. Welcome to Teaching with Power. This is Ben Wilcox, and thank you for taking the time to join me today. Today we're going to be studying Genesis chapters 37 to 41. So if you're ready, grab your scriptures and your marking pencils. It's time to dig deep. Now let me begin by saying that I'm not necessarily going to follow the manuals split in these chapters of the Joseph of Egypt story perfectly. So rather than calling these videos Genesis 37 to 41 and Genesis 42 to 50, I think that I'd instead call them Joseph of Egypt part one and Joseph of Egypt part two. I like to take his life as a whole and examine all the various lessons that his life teaches us from both the big picture perspective and, and the specific. Now that being said, I will try to focus more attention this week on the initial chapters and then the later chapters next week. But it's not going to be a perfect split. The story of Joseph of Egypt just happens to be one of the best, most principled, dense stories of all scripture. And, and I absolutely love it. It has so much to offer us. It's almost Shakespearean in a way, in its plot. There's intrigue, rivalry, seduction, jealousy, mistaken identity, triumph, and redemption. It's got to be one of the, the greatest stories of all time in my book. Now, as we study Joseph's life, I'm going to assume that you already know the story, the basic plot line. So I'm not going to present it necessarily in order or try to narrate it verse by verse or chapter by chapter. And, and I'm not going to really stick in chronological order either. That would make for a very long video. So if you've never read Genesis 37 to 50 before, I encourage you to do that first. And then come and study with me. And as a teacher, you may want to encourage your students to do the same. Or take five to ten minutes to go through the basic outline of what happens in Joseph's life. To help with that, though, if you like, I do have this short activity that might help your students to review at least the first half of the Joseph of Egypt story. All they need to do is place the following pictures from the life of Joseph in chronological order. And what this activity is going to allow you to do is just summarize the basic elements of what happens as you correct it with them. And for this activity, here's the correct order. First you have B. Joseph's father gives him a coat of many colors, which makes his brothers jealous of him. G. Eventually, the brothers throw Joseph into a pit and tell his father Jacob that he's been killed. Then J. Really, instead of killing him, they sell him as a slave to Midianites, who then sell him as a slave into Egypt. And then I, while in Egypt, Joseph ends up working for an Egyptian officer by the name of Potiphar, who puts him in charge of his entire household. Then C, all seems to be going well until Potiphar's wife attempts to seduce Joseph, who of course refuses and runs from her. But then F, she lies about it, says that Joseph was the aggressor, and Joseph is sent to prison. Where A, while in prison, Joseph interprets the dreams of his fellow prisoners, the chief butler and the baker. Then H, when the butler returns to his post, as Joseph had prophesied, eventually he tells the Pharaoh about Joseph, when the Pharaoh also has dreams that he can't understand. And Joseph interprets those dreams. Which leads to D, because of this, he's released from prison and praised by the Pharaoh. Then our final scene here, E, he is promoted to a high position of authority under the Pharaoh. Now that's a great oversimplification of the story, but that can at least serve as a bit of a review for your students. But to begin teaching the lessons of Joseph's life, as an icebreaker, I like to begin by showing my classes a number of optical illusions. These are all over the internet, so you can go ahead and just pick your favorites. Here are some of mine. Uh, these two lines are actually the same length. These lines are actually parallel, and they're not crooked. And then this one's, this one's really crazy. This is not an animated picture. 
if you look at it, it, it appears as if the circles are moving, but, but they really aren't. And then here, it appears as if there's a second triangle superimposed on the other, but really, it's only empty space. That looks like it's a triangle. Anyway, the moral of the story is that things are not always as they seem. Joseph's life, to me, is a kind of scriptural optical illusion. His life appears to be one thing for much of the story. When, with some time and a perspective shift, it turns out to be completely another. So as we study his life, keep your eyes peeled for the optical illusion of Joseph of Egypt's life. And the first thing I want to draw your attention to are all the negatives of Joseph's life. As you know, he experiences a great deal of hardship for much of his early life. And a great way to summarize and cover this would be with a crossword puzzle activity. And this activity is going to help you to highlight the struggles that Joseph faces. And, and it's going to set up the rest of the truths and the principles that his life teach us. So have your students fill in the blanks to these questions, and they'll get a good idea of exactly what his early life was really like. And you'll see that I didn't divide the questions up into across and down, because I like to maintain the flow of Joseph's life. And to do that, I had to mix up the order of the clues. So I suggest that you correct them in this order. So first, Joseph's early life. One down. Joseph's brothers hated him. And to go with that, five down. Joseph's brothers couldn't speak peaceably to him. And can you imagine what that must have been like for Joseph? Yes, his father loved him and praised him, but he just had a miserable time with his brothers. His home life was not ideal. Have any of you experienced the same thing? Do you sometimes look with longing at other families in your ward or neighborhood that seem to have everything going for them and wonder why you got the short end of the stick? Do you come from a troubled home? Remember that there was a bit of a rivalry between the sisters, Rachel and Leah. And Joseph and Benjamin are the only two children that Jacob bears directly with Rachel, his beloved wife. Leah seemed to despise Rachel's position as the preferred wife, and that same attitude is reflected in her children. Joseph represents something that they also despise. And to be fair, it does sound as if Jacob favors him, maybe a bit too much. Prophets aren't perfect, and therefore Jacob may have also contributed to the problem. But his brothers hate him. They don't speak kindly or peaceably to him. I'm sure there were plenty of cut downs and rolled eyes and snide remarks going around. And when you're the little brother, it's only natural to look up to your older brothers and want their acceptance and their approval. So that must have been very painful, troubling to Joseph. And his dreams don't help either. <laughs> and I don't know how you look at those, but is this, is this bragging on Joseph's part? Is he rubbing his position in their faces, boasting that he's one day going to be in charge? I don't think so. Remember, he's just a kid. The word that I would use to describe his sharing of his dreams with his brothers is guileless. He's naive. He's just had this amazing dream and wants to share it with his family, thinking that, that they'll be excited too. Maybe he's a little clueless about the effect that the telling of his dreams is going to have. Kind of reminds me of Joseph Smith telling the local preacher about the first vision. And, and then when the preacher doesn't react well, Joseph says that he's surprised at his reaction. And the rest of us are like, uh, really, Joseph? You're surprised at this? What did you expect? You just told him that his church wasn't true. Of course, he's not going to like that. Joseph is guileless. He's young. There's nothing negative or deceitful in him at all. He's just had a wonderful vision. and It's been an incredibly positive experience for him. And he wonders why everybody else isn't rejoicing with him in this thing. Instead, he's persecuted. 
and so was Joseph of Egypt. So now seven across. His coat was taken, and he was thrown into one of these by his brothers. A pit. So it finally comes to the point where Joseph's brothers have had it with him, and they're going to take action. Can you imagine how terrible that must have been for him? Thrown down into this this pit? This is more than just your average sibling rivalry. They're ready and willing to do physical violence to him. And we get a distressing detail that comes later in the story. Eight across. While he was in the pit, he called out to his brothers in anguish. But his brothers ignored him. Isn't that just a heartbreaking description? You can almost hear him calling out in anguish from that pit. Let me go, brothers. What are you doing? There must have been fear and anxiety in his voice. What a terrifying prospect. What are you going to do to me, my brothers? Please let me go. Just, just a kid. So three across, Joseph was sold into slavery to the Ishmaelites for 20 pieces of silver. Now, they don't kill him, thank heavens, but they do sell him. And this is not your average family problem, right? I don't think many of you are going to be able to relate to being sold into slavery. But perhaps some of you have faced abandonment, neglect, disregard from family members, just as Joseph does. That can be very, very painful, very difficult. His family wants to get rid of him. What effect must that have had on his soul? And we know, based on how he reacts to his brothers later, that this experience cuts deep to his heart. There's a lot of weeping later in the story that indicates the distress and the pain that Joseph's carried with him for years because of this thing. It wasn't something that he was just able to easily dismiss. It cut deep to his heart. For a cross, he was sold to a government official named Potiphar in this country, Egypt. And you know the story. This is where Joseph ends up. That's why he's later known as Joseph of Egypt. And the reason that Moses will need to lead the children out of Egypt later, eventually. If you've never made that connection, this is how they get there initially, through this story. So there he is serving as a servant in Egypt in the house of a government official by the name of Potiphar. And he's very loyal to Potiphar. He works hard for him. He's a very good slave. But seven down, after working for Potiphar for some time, Joseph was falsely accused of improper relations with his master's wife. Therefore, Potiphar had Joseph sent here. Prison. And then Joseph uses a different, more troubling word to describe where he sent. In six down. Joseph had done nothing to deserve being placed in the dungeon. So he's kept in a very miserable place. The dungeon doesn't sound like your average prison cell. This is a terrible, terrible location to be kept. And as you can probably imagine, a foreigner that's accused of adultery with an Egyptian official's wife is probably not going to be kept in the greatest of conditions. Which leads to our final clue. Two down. Joseph did a great service to the chief butler while in prison. After helping this man, he asked him to make mention of him to the pharaoh. Unfortunately, once the man left prison, he forgot or forgot about Joseph. So imagine that for a moment. Joseph thinks that he finally may have found his ticket out. He's helped the chief butler and hopes for a return of the favor. So he says, remember me once you get out. But he doesn't, probably for some time. Who knows how much time passes between the release of the butler and Joseph's encounter with the Pharaoh. And can you relate to that one? Have you ever had your hopes lifted only to have them dashed later on the rocks of reality? That often makes hard trials even harder. And it's like, come on, it would have been better just to have no hope at all, but to anticipate a release and then not have it come to pass, that's torturous. Now, this activity 
can help to serve as the backdrop for the truths that Joseph's life can teach us. Compare what we just learned about Joseph's life with this next set of verses. All I want you to do is compare them and see if you can identify any truths that Joseph's life teaches us. So Genesis 39, 2-6. After being sold as a slave to Potiphar, and the Lord was with Joseph, and he was a prosperous man, and he was in the house of his master, the Egyptian. And his master saw that the Lord was with him, and that the Lord made all that he did to prosper in his hand. And Joseph found grace in his sight, and he served him, and he made him overseer over his house, and all that he had he put into his hand. And it came to pass from the time that he had made him overseer in his house, and over all that he had, that the Lord blessed the Egyptian's house for Joseph's sake. And the blessing of the Lord was upon all that he had in the house and in the field. And he left all that he had in Joseph's hand. And he knew not aught he had, save the bread which he did eat. And Joseph was a goodly person and well favored. And then, after being thrown into prison, Genesis 39, 21 to 23, But the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy and gave him favor in the sight of the keeper of the prison. And the keeper of the prison committed to Joseph's hand all the prisoners that were in the prison. And whatsoever they did there, he was the doer of it. The keeper of the prison looked not to anything that was under his hand, because the Lord was with him. And that which he did, the Lord made it to prosper. Okay, now, what principles can those teach us? Just have your students share their thoughts. I'm sure they'll come up with some. Here are a few things they might bring up. Principle number one, the Lord is with us in our sufferings. Do you see how many times it said that the Lord was with Joseph? At least four different times. Sometimes it's easy when bad things happen to come to the conclusion that we're being punished or that God's not there or that he's not listening or that he doesn't care. The story of Joseph shows that that's not the case. Hardship is not an indicator of God's disapproval of us. It's simply a part of our mortal test. But God's not going to abandon us to endure our trials alone if we turn to him. He may not remove the trial, but he'll join us and support us throughout. It's much easier to endure hardship when you have a member of the Godhead standing with you. Joseph continued to maintain his faith and trust in God even during his darkest times. He doesn't equate his adversity with godly displeasure or disregard. The Lord prospers him. He finds grace. Uh, He's given responsibility. Uh, The Lord blesses him and everything that he does. He's a goodly person. He's well favored, even despite the very, very negative circumstances of his life. I believe that in our darkest times, that God still responds to our prayers, that he, he mourns, he weeps, he even suffers alongside us. We saw that in the vision of Enoch as he witnesses the laughing of Satan, but then the weeping of God. We see it in the weeping of Jesus at the funeral of Lazarus. He weeps even though he knows that he's just about to raise Lazarus from the dead and that all that sadness is going to turn to joy in just moments. But their sadness causes him sadness. Jesus truly lived up to the covenant of mourning with those that mourn. And he'll do the same with us. I think it helps to keep this in mind when we face the difficulties of life, that God isn't usually responsible for those hardships. Life is, or the agency of others. For example, I don't believe that God gave my mom cancer, who then passed away. I believe that life, or mortality, gave my mom cancer, and that God was with us during the entire ordeal. And that idea leads us to the next principle that I see here. Principle number two. When you find yourself living the unexpected life, Make the best of it, and don't be mad at God. 
Joseph is definitely living an unexpected life here. I imagine that many of you can relate. You may be living a life that you never anticipated, never wanted, never asked for. Accidents, disease, divorce, death of a loved one, challenges in your career can all come unexpectedly. Maybe some of you thought you'd be married by now or have children. You thought you'd be further along in your education or your career. You thought that your present financial success would make you happy. You never expected to be a divorcee or a widower or unemployed or handicapped or sick. I'm pretty sure Joseph never anticipated as he walked towards his brothers in the field that day that he was going to end up as a slave in Egypt. And as a slave in Egypt, I doubt Joseph ever anticipated as he walked by Potiphar's wife's room that he would shortly end up languishing in prison. However, Joseph's attitude towards his unexpected life is what's so inspiring to me. He makes the best of it. It's almost as if when he becomes a slave, he says to himself, okay, well, if I have to be a slave, I'm going to be the best darn slave that I know how. I'm going to be loyal to my master. I'm going to work hard. I'm going to do everything I can to help my master prosper. I'll take good care of everything that he's placed in my charge, even though it's not really mine. And I'm going to continue to rely on God and trust in him. And then what does Joseph get for all his loyalty and all his hard work? He gets thrown into prison for it. So you'd think at that point, Joseph is going to get pretty bitter, pretty upset with life or God. Anger, resentment, bitterness, depression, despair would all be understandable emotions to, to this situation. He might say to himself, all I've ever done is to try to choose the right. And what do I get? Are you kidding me, God? I don't deserve this. And, and he's right. He doesn't deserve it. But that's not his attitude. As he's sitting there in prison, he basically says to himself, okay, if I have to be a prisoner, I'm going to be the best darn prisoner that I know how. I'm not going to get angry with God or abandon all hope. See, Joseph was the kind of man that was able to accept the hand that he was dealt and run with it. He makes the best out of a bad situation. He takes lemons and makes lemonade. He's, to borrow a cliche, yet still powerful term from corporate America, he's proactive. He focuses on the things that are under his control and disregards the rest. He lives the spirit of the serenity prayer. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. That's... Reinhold Niebuhr, who says that. And that's inspiring to me. Maybe we can apply the same Joseph attitude to our situation in life, whatever it is. If I have to be a widower, I'm going to be the best widower I can be and trust in God. If I have to be a single parent, I'm going to be the best darn single parent that I can and trust in God. If I have to be disabled, I'm going to be the best darn disabled person I can be and trust in God. If I have to be a cancer patient, I'm going to be the best darn cancer patient I can be and trust in God. And on and on, and in whatever difficult circumstances you might find yourself in in life. And have you ever met anybody like that? Somebody who, who can maintain their enthusiasm for life in less than ideal circumstances? I have. I can think of a number of them. And they're so inspiring. Much stronger than I am. These people are Joseph's. And then really quickly, just for a second, principle three. As a prisoner, when he sees the butler and the baker looking puzzled and dejected over their dreams, what does Joseph do? Verses six and seven. And Joseph came in unto them in the morning and looked upon them. And behold, they were sad. And he asked Pharaoh's officers that were with him in the ward of his Lord's house, saying, Wherefore look ye so sadly today? I love that. Joseph cares about people. 
even his fellow prisoners. He wants to try to cheer them up. He wasn't self-centered in his suffering. And it's so easy to be, isn't it? It's very natural to turn inward when we suffer and wallow in self-pity. Joseph doesn't do that. He turns outward even in the worst of his own circumstances. And perhaps that illustrates a third principle. Sometimes the best way to alleviate your own suffering is to seek to alleviate the suffering of others. Jesus is a great example of that principle as he hangs on the cross, while in the midst of his great agony. By what he says, we know that he's thinking about others. His mother, the thief hanging next to him, the very people who were crucifying him. He focused his attention outward, just like Joseph does here. Joseph's a very good person. And that leads us to the fourth principle. God does, in fact, allow bad things to happen to good people. Notice I didn't say cause, but allow. And that's a hard truth for a lot of us to accept. When we see good, innocent, worthy people suffering, that can be a real test of our faith. This fact of life will even drive some people to abandon their faith in God or to believe terrible things about him. It's called the problem of pain. Many struggle to come to grips with a God that allows tragedy and pain in people's lives. Not just the people that we might think that deserve it, but the people that don't deserve it. The innocent, the pure, the righteous, the defenseless, the weak. It's hard to come to terms with a God that allows things like war, disease, exploitation, poverty, abuse, cruelty, and oppression occur. Hopefully we can be like Joseph, though, in response to these kinds of things. He doesn't attribute these problems to God. He attributes them to life and the agency of others. The next principle we take a look at, though, I feel can help us to better understand this more troubling one. And for this last principle, I want you to take a look at the crossword puzzle one more time and compare it to these verses. I'm spotlighting this principle on its own because I feel it's probably the greatest principle of Joseph's life. I even refer to it as the Joseph of Egypt principle. It's the principle that I feel, if understood, can really help us to get through our most difficult times. It's a principle we saw last year in the Doctrine and Covenants as another Joseph, Joseph Smith, was imprisoned in Liberty Jail. And here in the Old Testament, we really get to feel that principle, and experience it alongside with Joseph of Egypt. So compare the crossword puzzle with these verses. They come immediately after Joseph interprets Pharaoh's dream and offers his solution for the 14 coming years of feast than famine. What does Joseph's life teach us? Genesis 41 verses 37 to 45. And the thing was good in the eyes of Pharaoh and in the eyes of all his servants. And Pharaoh said unto his servants, Can we find such a one as this is, a man in whom the Spirit of God is? And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, For as much as God hath showed thee all this, there is none so discreet and wise as thou art. Thou shalt be over my house, and according unto thy word shall all my people be ruled. Only in the throne will I be greater than thou. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, See, I have set thee over all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh took off his ring from his hand and put it upon Joseph's hand and arrayed him in vestures of fine linen and put a gold chain about his neck. And he made him to ride in the second chariot which he had. And they cried before him, Bow the knee. And he made him ruler over all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh said unto Joseph, I am Pharaoh, and without thee shall no man lift up his hand or foot in all the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh called Joseph's name zaphnath Penea, maybe. And he gave him to wife Asnath, the daughter of Potipharah, priest of On. And Joseph went out over all the land of Egypt. What a turn of events! What a transformation! He goes from prisoner to prince. Just think of what got him there, though. If he'd never been sent to prison... He'd never have met the chief butler. If he'd never have met the chief butler, he would never have met the pharaoh. 
If he had never met the Pharaoh, he would never have had the opportunity to bless and save his brothers and family back in Canaan. So when it seems that one door has closed in your life, remember that God is the kind of God that can open other doors. And perhaps that opening will lead to something even greater and better in the future. And look at what Joseph names his two sons in Genesis 41, verses 50 to 52. What does he call them? Manasseh and Ephraim. Now go to the Bible dictionary really quick. Remember that names mean something in the Old Testament. Parents often chose specific names for their children to remind them of things, to teach them things. We saw that with Isaac, the children of Rachel and Leah, and here with Joseph's two sons. And we find that Manasseh means forgetting, and Ephraim means fruitful. He names his boys after the great principle of his life. And Read these verses again and, and you'll see it. And unto Joseph were born two sons before the years of famine came, which Asenath, the daughter of Potiphar, priest of On, bare unto him. And Joseph called the name of the firstborn Manasseh. For God, said he, hath made me forget all my toil and all my father's house. And the name of the second called he Ephraim. For God hath caused me to be fruitful in the land of my affliction. In our adversities, in our trials, in our tests of faith. If we can just remember that at some point in the future, if we remain faithful, God will bless us in such a way that we will forget all our troubles. And he'll make us fruitful, even in the land of our affliction. Every time Joseph saw his two boys, he was reminded of that principle. And I believe that that principle is true for all problems and trials. And even if that blessing doesn't come in this life, it's certain to come in the next. One of my favorite verses of all scripture is found in Revelation 21 verse 4. She talks about the millennium. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things are passed away. See, God can get rid of all those things. He can wipe away all tears. He can turn all negatives into positives with time and perspective. Perhaps Romans 8.28 sums the principle up best. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. All trials have an end for those that love God. God can take even the hardest or worst of our struggles and make something good come of them. What was it that God said to Joseph Smith in his dungeon after listing all the terrible things that had or could happen to him? Know thou, my son, that all these things shall give thee experience and shall be for thy good. That's God's power. The ability to make all things good in the end. Even the worst of things. I believe it's interesting how Joseph explains his life to his brothers later in the story who are being eaten up by the guilt of what they did to him all those years ago. And here's his perspective on the trials of his life. He says in Genesis 45, verses 5 through 8, Now therefore be not grieved, nor angry with yourselves, that ye sold me hither, for God did send me before you to preserve life. For these two years hath the famine been in the land, and yet there are five years, in the which there shall neither be earring nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve you a posterity in the earth, and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So now it was not you that sent me hither, but God. And he hath made me a father to Pharaoh, and lord of all his house, and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. Now, do you think he's saying that God inspired his brothers to hate him and to persecute him and sell him into Egypt? No. Is he saying that God inspired Potiphar's wife to try and seduce him that would lead him to his imprisonment? No. Was it God that made the butler forget about him? 
I don't think that's it at all. What do I think he means here? Well, for one, I just think he's being nice. He's trying to comfort his brothers because he can see how badly they're feeling. So it's maybe his way of saying, don't beat yourselves up over this. Look what's happened. I'm okay. And not only that, I'm in a position to help and bless you. What I really think Joseph's saying here is that God was able to take this terrible situation caused by the ill use of the agency of others and make it into something good. That's what God did with Joseph's life. I don't just think that all these events were meant to be or that this had to happen so that later things would happen. They're just a description of what did happen and how God was able to make it good. I imagine if other things had happened, God would have been able to make those situations good. Joseph's life could have very well turned out differently. And because of his attitude, God would have blessed him in that also. Because ultimately, it's not what happens to us that defines us. It's how we react to it. And because Joseph maintained his faith in God, God made it all good. And the same can be true with us. God has the power to do this kind of thing with us. He can take anything, anything, no matter how negative, no matter how painful, and turn it into something good. Just as long as we're willing to put it into his hands. He can do that with our trials. He can do that with our mistakes. He can do that with our sins, even. He can do that with our tragedies. That principle is taught again through Jacob in this story. He says something very ironic in Genesis 42, verse 36. Let's look at this same principle here. For some background, though, Joseph's brothers at this point have met him. And they're coming to buy food during the famine. But they don't recognize him. And Joseph hasn't revealed who he is to them yet. And you can probably suspect why. He doesn't just run up and say, look, it's me, Joseph, your long lost brother. Why wouldn't he do that? Well, what was the last interaction that he had with these brothers? They were plotting to kill him, and then they sold him into Egypt. What would make him think that they would want to see him at all? But as Joseph overhears them speaking in Hebrew, he begins to suspect that perhaps they are sorry about what they've done. As so what we see next there are some testing chapters. And don't for a second think that Joseph, as he puts the money back in their sacks and imprisons Simeon, and later when he frames Benjamin with the golden cup, that he's doing this out of a spirit of revenge. Like, (laughs) I'm going to get them back. Now I'm going to make them suffer. That's not Joseph's character. It's not in him to do that. He's testing them. He's doing some detective work. He's trying to see how they feel about things. Have they changed? Would they, maybe, perhaps, be excited to see him? Could he return to his father and see him again? So first, Joseph wants to know for sure if his blood brother, Benjamin, is really still alive. Because in Joseph's eyes, he counts ten brothers, not eleven. Have they done the same thing to Benjamin as they did to him? Have they finally gotten rid of all of Rachel's children? Are they lying about him being alive? It's possible. So he gives them food, then demands that they bring back Benjamin. And to make sure that they do, in fact, bring him back again, he takes Simeon prisoner as collateral. And brief interjection. Why Simeon and not Reuben, the eldest of the brothers? Well, maybe because of what Joseph finally learns about Reuben here. When he overhears the brothers talking, he finds out that Reuben didn't want to sell him into Egypt. Genesis 42, 22. And Reuben answered them, saying, Spake I not unto you, saying, Do not sin against the child, and ye would not hear? Therefore, behold, also his blood is required. After all those years, Joseph finally learns here that his big brother Reuben wasn't in on it, that he was trying to save him. And it's at that point that Joseph turns and weeps. So instead of taking Reuben, he takes Simeon. 
perhaps trusting in the fact that Reuben will take good care of Benjamin and assure his safety if they bring him back. And as the boys return, Joseph has put all their money back into their sacks. And they discover this when they get home. And they're really concerned. And they tell Jacob about all that happened to them when they went into Egypt. Now read Genesis 42 verse 36 and tell me what's ironic here. And Jacob their father said unto them, Me have ye bereaved of my children. Joseph is not, and Simeon is not, and ye will take Benjamin away. All these things are against me. Now is that true? Are all these things against him? They sure seem like it. But are they in reality? No, it's just the opposite. All these things are for him. In fact, in just a short amount of time, not only is Simeon going to be returned to him and Benjamin, but Joseph too. The son that he thinks is dead is going to be returned to him. Oh, and then bonus blessing, their famine problems are going to be solved. They're not going to have to worry about the next five years of famine. God is actually setting Jacob up for success and blessing in this whole situation. Sometimes that's how God works in our lives. I think that sometimes in my life, I've thought, all these things are against me. Have you ever wanted to shout that out? But in reality, if I could just pull back a little bit and look at the same situation with God's eyes, there's going to be a time when I'm going to look back and I'm going to say, wow, all these things were for me. I know of a man in my ward once who felt great anxiety when he lost his job. Months went by with no prospects and things became quite difficult financially for them. But he kept his faith. And, eventually, he ended up being hired for a better position with better pay in a better location than he had before. The trial, the difficulty, was only a stepping stone to something much better in the end. So the loss of his job was not against him, but for him. That, that interim time was difficult and discouraging, but it all worked out to be better in the end. The end of one relationship may signal the beginning of a better one in the future. The trial of faith that you face today may provide you with a stronger, more powerful faith tomorrow. Remember that things that may seem to be against you may actually be working for you. With time and perspective, things can change. All things work together for good to them that love God. Trial becomes triumph. Misfortune becomes marvel. Suffering becomes success. And adversity becomes advantage. C.S. Lewis taught this truth powerfully in one of my favorite quotes that I, that I know I've shared before. But he said, You cannot in your present state understand eternity, but you can get some likeness of it if you say that both good and evil, when they are full grown, become retrospective. All this earthly past will have been heaven to those who are saved. All their life on earth, too, will then be seen by the damned to have been hell. That is what mortals misunderstand. They say of some temporal suffering, no future bliss can make up for it. Not knowing that heaven, once attained, will work backwards and turn even that agony into a glory. That's what happened with Joseph. And of some sinful pleasure, they say, let me have but this and I'll take the consequences. Little dreaming how damnation will spread back and back into their past and contaminate the pleasure of the sin. Both processes begin even before death. The good man's past begins to change so that his forgiven sins and remembered sorrows take on the quality of heaven. The bad man's past already conforms to his badness and is filled only with dreariness. And that is why, at the end of all things, when the sun rises here 
in heaven. And the twilight turns to blackness down there. The blessed will say, we have never lived anywhere except in heaven. And the lost, we were always in hell. And both will speak truly. Ah, the saved. What happens to them is best described as the opposite of a mirage. What seemed when they entered it to be the veil of misery turns out when they look back to have been a well. And where present experience saw only salt deserts, memory truthfully records that the pools were full of water. This is the the optical illusion principle. All things work together for good to those who love God. We believe in a God that has the power to take all the negatives of our lives. And we may have a lot. Some of you, I'm sure, could sit down and list all your negatives. I've had this one, and this one, and this one, and this one. And what God can do and will do For those that love him, and he's going to come along someday, and he's going to take each and every one of those negatives and cross them and turn each and every single one of them into a positive. Think about that. Have you experienced that? To liken the scriptures. Have you ever seen the Joseph principle in your life or the life of someone you know? What happened? Have you ever seen God make something good out of something difficult or challenging? Or when have you felt the Lord was with you in one of your trials? If you'll forgive me for this reference, I'll admit that I do enjoy the Lord of the Rings movies. And there's a very memorable speech given by Sam at a very dark moment in the story. Frodo says, I can't do this, Sam. And Sam responds with, I know, it's all wrong. By rights, we shouldn't even be here. I can imagine Joseph of Egypt feeling the same way in prison. But we are. It's like in the great stories, Mr. Frodo, the ones that really mattered, full of darkness and danger they were. And sometimes you didn't want to know the end, because how could the end be happy? How could the world go back to the way it was when so much bad had happened? But in the end, it's only a passing thing, this shadow. Even darkness must pass. A new day will come, and when the sun shines, it will shine out the clearer. Those were the stories that stayed with you. That meant something, even if you were too small to understand why. But I think, Mr. Frodo, I do understand. I know now. Folk in those stories had lots of chances of turning back. Only they didn't. They kept going because they were holding on to something. Frodo asks, what are we holding on to, Sam? That there's some good in this world, Mr. Frodo, and it's worth fighting for. Well, I believe the story of Joseph of Egypt is one of those stories that really matters kind of story that stays with you. We believe in a God of happy endings. It doesn't matter how dark, how discouraging, how tragic the circumstances. If we remain true and faithful and fight for what's good in this world, and like Joseph, one day I'm confident that God will will turn all our negatives into positives. Our lives will turn out to be like optical illusions, like the reverse of a mirage. What appears to be one thing will actually turn out to be another. There's going to be times in our lives when it all seems dark. Everything's falling apart. Or that God has abandoned us. But one day I believe that we'll all discover that God was with us all along. And all will work together for good. So if you're going through one of these Genesis 37 to 40 times in your life. Keep in mind that your Genesis 41 may be waiting just around the corner. And may that give you hope. And when that triumph comes, I believe that you too 
will Manasseh and Ephraim. You'll forget the pain and enjoy the fruitfulness of God's deliverance and blessing. And until then, hold on. Well, I'm not going to spend time covering the events of Genesis chapter 38 in this video. Probably wouldn't in class either. It does seem to interrupt the Joseph narrative. But I do believe that there's a deliberate purpose for that chapter. Besides revealing the hypocrisy of the double standard, the story in that chapter about Judah and Tamar serves as a contrast between Judah's approach to sexual purity and Joseph's. Where Judah is casual and indulgent, Joseph is careful and diligent. And that's why I think chapter 38 is in there, to serve as a backdrop and a contrast to what Joseph does in chapter 39. And that's where we're going to turn our attention now. For an icebreaker, I like to remind my students of a certain principle of nature, which I'm sure they've heard of before. When animals or humans are faced with danger, they react in one of two ways. And to make it more memorable, those two words begin with the letter F and they rhyme. What are those two words? What are the two ways to react to danger? Fight or flight. Now, as humans, we oftentimes don't admire that second strategy much. We feel it's so much more admirable to fight danger. Flight seems cowardly or weak. But let's use another example here, an object lesson. And at that point, I pull out a mouse trap, or even better, one of those giant rat traps. And I say, which is the better option for the mouse in this instance, fight or flight? Is the mouse going to win in a fight against this? No, no way. And I'll usually very carefully trip the trap with a pencil or a long nail or something. The mouse's best option in this case is to run from it, to flee it. And the same is true with us. When we face the danger or the traps of temptation, oftentimes the best option we will have is to run from it. Yes, there's times when we'll need to fight temptation and evil, but sometimes fleeing, rather than being a sign of weakness or cowardice, may be the bravest thing that we ever do. We can bravely run away. Well, Joseph of Egypt is going to teach us some great principles on resisting temptation in Genesis chapter 39. And the big question of the lesson is, how is Joseph a great example of what we can do when we encounter any temptation in general, and sexual temptation in particular. That can be fornication, adultery, pornography, or any sin of a sexual nature. How can these verses help us? Genesis 39, 7-12. And here there's a teaching activity that I'd like to share with you that makes this kind of question particularly effective and engaging. If you can Project the actual image of the scriptures up on a whiteboard and supply a marker for your students to use. You then invite them to read the circled verses and come to the front and mark any phrases or words that they see that answer our question. But, but one at a time. The only catch is that they have to explain why they marked that particular thing. And sometimes I'll even offer them a treat if they're willing to put themselves out there and share something with the class. And I've found that students tend to enjoy interacting with the scriptures in this way. If this method isn't possible for you, you can have them do the same kind of thing in their own scriptures and share their ideas with the class. And here are some of the things that they might mark or that you might discuss. Verse 8, he refused. And that's the simple answer on how you deal with temptation. Refuse. Refuse to give in. Refuse to listen to the tempting voices. And it sounds like this reaction comes fairly quickly and automatically from Joseph. It's as if he's already decided beforehand how he's going to react in tempting circumstances. He's committed to God and obedience. And I suggest we do the same. Don't wait until the moment of temptation to decide how you're going to react. Choose your side now. So that when the time comes, you can refuse swiftly and instinctively. 
I don't do that. I don't look at that kind of stuff. I don't entertain those possibilities. Make that obedient spirit a part of your identity and character. You can say, I'm proud to be sexually pure. I'm loyal to my spouse, no matter what. I don't push boundaries. I don't look at pornography. A commitment to refusal will make those moments of temptation much easier to handle. In verse 9, we see that part of Joseph's motivation for refusing Potiphar's wife is because of his loyalty to two individuals. And who are they? Potiphar and God. First Potiphar. There's none greater in this house than I, neither hath he kept back anything from me but thee, because thou art his wife. Perhaps that kind of thought will help us when we're tempted. We can ask ourselves, who is this going to hurt besides me? Who would I be betraying or wounding by doing this thing? My children? My spouse? My parents? My future spouse and children? Friends or associates around me that look to me as an example? Little brothers and sisters? The very person who's tempting me? I mean, he's he's trying to protect her. We would do well to consider the collateral damage that might be done by our immoral actions. Then, more importantly, Joseph adds somebody else that he's concerned about offending. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? Joseph also considers offending God in his decision. He says, I don't want to offend my father in heaven. He's responsible for all that I have and am. I don't want to betray my faith in him. And I even feel that Joseph's current situation adds to the power of his refusal. Just consider the nature of his life. He's always done what's right and honored God. And look where it's gotten him. He very easily could have said to himself, What good has honoring God ever done for me? Why should I worry about offending him in this? My life's been nothing but hard. Why not indulge in this affair? Something pleasurable has presented itself to me. Enjoy this little liaison. But he doesn't. He trusts in and is obedient to his Father in heaven, even when the blessings of heaven don't appear to be forthcoming in his life at that time. Instead, he says, I'm not going to offend God. Who cares what worldly consequences that may bring? And it will bring major consequences. But he says, I don't do this, come what may. And he doesn't. His devotion to God gave him the strength necessary to resist temptation. Now, there's another principle in verse 9 that I feel is noteworthy. What does he call sexual sin? This great wickedness. Truth, sexual sin is great wickedness. It's serious. In a world that glorifies casual sex, that revels in sensuality, that demeans marriage, that mocks sexual purity, this is an important principle. It is serious. I don't think it's a coincidence that the Ten Commandments say, thou shalt not kill, and then immediately follow it with, thou shalt not commit adultery. The world's not going to agree with that. They're not going to place sexual sin next to murder. So why does God? I think it's because life is a serious thing to our Father in heaven. The worth of souls is great in the sight of God. So his laws concerning the ending of life as well as his laws concerning the creating of life, are serious and not to be trifled with. Now, of course, there is repentance and hope to those that may have fallen into this error. And and through the power of the atonement, sins can be washed clean. But we just have to realize that sexual sin is serious. Don't fall for that lie that comes from the world. Now verse 10, And it came to pass as she spake to Joseph day by day, that he hearkened not unto her, to lie by her or to be with her. A couple of things we have going on here. One, we've got to be persistent and diligent in refusing temptation. It's not the kind of thing that you can say no to once and expect to be done with it. 
It requires constant vigilance and steady carefulness. Potiphar's wife is the living embodiment of the nature of lust. It's not easily dissuaded and can often show up when we least expect it. We've got to watch ourselves day by day because it's not going to give up on tempting us. Remember that to overcome the adversary, we're required to endure to the end. Also, Joseph does everything in his power to stay away from her, to avoid being even close to that temptation. I suggest we do the same. Stay as far away from sin as humanly possible. Don't put yourself into tempting situations. Don't be alone with that person if you know it could lead to tempting or inappropriate actions. Don't be alone with unfiltered access to the internet. Make yourself accountable. Sometimes to avoid sin, we need constraints as well as restraint. A person should go where they won't be tempted, no matter how strong they think they are. However, no matter how hard you try to avoid tempting situations, sooner or later, you're probably going to find yourself in one. As careful as Joseph is, eventually in verse 11, we find out that he is alone with her in the house. Probably a situation orchestrated by her. Satan is equally as clever and nowadays has made it possible for us to be tempted in this way at any time and anywhere. Pornography certainly existed when I was a teenager, but was definitely less pervasive and available. Nowadays, that temptation can always be with us on our mobile devices or laptops. So in those cases, restraint must be exercised. I also like the phrase that Joseph was doing his business at that time. Staying busy, staying occupied, doing what we know we should be doing can also help us to avoid temptation. Idleness is the devil's workshop. I'll often counsel those who are struggling with pornography to not only eliminate the negative practice in their life, but to add something positive to fill the space that it leaves behind. Find something else that keeps you enthused and motivated. Work, stay busy. Adopt a new habit that is fulfilling and constructive to take the place of the sin. And then we have verse 12. It's so good. When he's actually facing the situation, how does he respond to it? I love how this is worded. He fled and got him out. He ran from it. He bravely ran away. He didn't stop to think about it. He didn't mull it over in his mind. He didn't stop to negotiate. He didn't hesitate. He just ran. Paul put it this way. Flee fornication in 1 Corinthians 6, 18. So when all your careful planning and avoiding and deciding and staying busy has failed to keep you from the face of temptation, the last course of defense is to run. No matter how it looks to those around you, no matter what the consequences may be, they're sure to be less severe than giving in, less eternal and damaging in nature. Sometimes, for fun, I like to pair this technique for avoiding sin with what I call the Alma 1123 method. And I tell them that if anybody ever tries to push them into doing something that they're not comfortable with, if somebody attempts to coerce them into going too far, then they should point their finger at the other person, shout Alma 1123, and then pull a Joseph on them turn around and run away as fast as they can, screaming. And then the other person's going to be so curious that they're going to look that verse up. Then they'll get their message. And I'll let you check that one out on your own. And as embarrassing as that may be, better to be embarrassed than make a decision that could lead to such serious repercussions. Or if somebody tries to get them to watch or look at something sleazy or pornographic, To do the same thing. Shout Alma 1123 and turn around and run away, screaming. Or if a temptation appears on their phone, I challenge them to shout Alma 1123 at the phone, throw it as far away from them as they can, and then turn around and run away, screaming. Of course, they laugh at this a little. But then I ask, seriously though, what's worse? A broken phone or a destructive addiction? Choice is ours. So the truth, sexual sin is serious. Do everything in your power to avoid it. And when it presents itself to you, run from it. To liken the scriptures, 
How can the example of Joseph of Egypt help you to resist temptation in general and sexual temptation in particular? So to summarize, if we wish to be successful in resisting temptation, we can decide now that we're going to refuse it. We can consider how our actions will affect others and offend God. We can recognize the seriousness of the sin. We can be persistent and consistent in our strength. We can avoid placing ourselves in tempting circumstances. We can stay busy. And perhaps most importantly of all, when the mousetrap of sin appears in our path, offering its enticing baits, I hope that we will turn around and run. We will flight and not fight. We will get us out of that situation. Be a smart mouse and live. And that's all I have for you today, my friends. Now next week, Joseph of Egypt has a whole lot more to teach us. So we'll take a look at Joseph of Egypt's life part two next time. So I hope you'll join me. If you haven't subscribed yet, I encourage you to do that. Uh, The best thing that you could do if you found this material helpful, share it with somebody that you know it could help. Uh, Make a comment, uh, hit hit the like button, uh, turn on the notification bell so that you can see when a new video comes out. All those things help to uh, spread the word. If you're a teacher and you'd like the resources that I make, go to teachingwithpower.com and you'll find links to those resources. Thank you so much for watching. Now get out there and teach with power.